Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us in today's session, Mindset Marketing. Uh, my name is Robin Bu, and I am an account manager at HTK Marketing Communications in Duluth, Minnesota. Um, and we are one of the sponsors here at Shushmed. Uh, today I have the pleasure of introducing Melissa Allen and Brian Bennett. Um, Melissa is, lost my notes, <laughs> Melissa is uh, Director of Marketing and Public Relations at St. Joseph Candler Hospital in Savannah, Georgia. She has been in marketing for 25 years and 19 of those have been in healthcare marketing. Uh, Brian is uh, President of STIR Advertising and Integrated Marketing. Brian's advertising career began as an account manager or account executive in 1983 in uh, Minneapolis at Bozell. Yep. Since then, he has worked uh, at DMBNB, Ralston Perina, Laughlin Constable, and ConAgra before opening his own agency, Stir LLC. Brian's diverse agency and client side experience has provided him with the knowledge and skill to successfully lead multiple clients to unbounded success, yet he claims his <laughs> most uh, crowning achievement is leading a Little League baseball team to a championship. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Brian and Melissa. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks all for coming. I, uh, it's uh, awesome. Uh, very, very much appreciate it. Um, and it's my pleasure to be up here with my good friend and colleague and client, Melissa. We have been friends for and uh, done business together for over 15 years. And, um, you know, previously at another shop and then now most recently with, uh, with my shop for the last 10 years. And what we um, are excited to, to show you is a strategy that we devised almost 10 years ago. Uh, going back about eight, nine years, uh, that, that really uh, does a, a, an interesting uh, job of utilizing some syndicated research that's out there, some local research, and um, uh, combining the two uh, to develop a messaging platform that, that really, really worked. Uh, it wasn't perfect, but, it, but it's worked quite well during that period of time. So we have eight years of success that, that, uh, to, to show for for what we've done here that I think uh, brings some validity to it. So Melissa's going to tell us a little bit about Savannah, Georgia. And by the way, you're going to find out why, uh, by the end uh, of, the, of the presentation here, why I got so much respect for a very smart lady, a very, very nice lady. So. He's just making up for the fact that he wrote a longer bio for me. <laughs> Did you all notice that? Okay, is this, can I'm you, in marketing. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, okay. Yeah, I thought, wow, come on. <laughs> okay, um, yes, yeah, Savannah, Georgia. How many of you have ever been to Savannah, Georgia? Oh, good. That's great. Um, it's a much bigger community than you think it is. Uh, we do have two hospitals in our healthcare system. We have 25 other locations and um, multiple places, but we actually serve about 29 counties. So if you know anything about Georgia, you know, we do have the whole Savannah area where we are right next to South Carolina. So we're dealing with the Hilton Head, Bluffton, and you've been to Hilton Head, I hope. Um, so we're dealing with the Hilton Head crowd, we're dealing with uh, a number of military bases, we have a Georgia port there, we have manufacturing, we are a retirement community, we are a tourism industry. It's a very, very interesting community to be in. Um, so uh, we do have several centers of excellence that we like to focus on and we have focused on in our research and that's the purpose for having them on here. Um, but I did want to make a point. It's a very unique market, and I think that all of us as marketers have to really understand that not every market is the same, and you can't just go and read rating books. You know, you just can't look at the numbers. You have to really understand on a myopic level um, how your community works, and that's a, what is really, really different about Savannah, Georgia, and St. Joseph's County. I did want to mention that we're both um, faith-based institutions. Some of you probably have dealt with that. One of our hospitals is Catholic, and one is Methodist. And we actually entered into a joint operating agreement in 1997, and it stuck. You know, a lot of those don't necessarily stick, but it did stick, and after six years, it became self-perpetuating. Um, so our market, as you can see, it's, it's probably a little bit larger than you thought it was. Um, when you really start looking at the, the regional area, you can see um, just how large the population is. Um, but it's also a very, very loud advertiser. A lot of television, 
um, very fragmented radio. And in the time period that we're looking at, I want to emphasize that the time that we're going to talk to you about today is the time between 2000 and 2003. Um, at that time, um, advertising they was doing some really, really crazy things in our market. And I knew that we were going to have to come up with some unique solutions to make sure that we can make our advertising dollar really work effectively. Because we knew we weren't going to get any more. And I'm sure you all have had that same problem. We're not going to get any more money. So how are we going to make it work better? Right. And the situation here is that you, know, you also have secondary um, providers trying to make inroads into the main, into the main right. market. And you're up against um, a very established uh, academic medical center. So I'm sure all of you can relate to the fact, as, as Brian said, that you know, we do have a, a, a big primary competitor who is an academic facility. Um, we have hospitals that are owned by physicians in our region, a lot of freestanding facilities. And in that time period, in that 2003 time period, we were being outspent three to one. Um, needless to say, uh, it w our competitors were ubiquitous, okay? You couldn't turn the corner, you couldn't look at a billboard, you couldn't turn on the TV um, without seeing um, advertising by our competitor. So, you know, you have to take pause and say, is this working? Is it oversaturation? How much of it's lost? How much is it working? So we really, really need to do some work to find out how is this impacting our own health system? Because, you know, a lot of times the effects of those things don't take place for a number of years to come. So we wanted to make sure that we were prepared for that. focus groups. So when we, when we started looking at it, we said, well, let's start out with some focus groups and find out what do people really, really think about us. Okay, so we are faith-based. So naturally, what do we win? We win in compassionate care, right? We always win in compassionate care and caring and compassionate nurses. So anytime we did our focus groups, everyone said, y'all are just the most compassionate healthcare system. Oh, we love, we love, you love your nurses. And then we'd say, yeah, but what about technology? Because we knew we had some of the best technology. And they'd go, oh, but y'all are just so nice. <laughs> you know, y'all are so nice. Well, OK, is that a key driver? Is that a key driver of choice? Is it? Uh, I'm sure some of you have faced the same thing. You know, you, you have missions and your boards, and everyone says, you know, get out there and tell everybody about all the great things that we're doing. Tell them about all those great things we're doing. Well, OK, but does that make a person make a choice? So that was the question at that time period. So I'm dealing with multiple issues at that time. I'm being outspent three to one. Everyone's telling me how sweet and great we are and how wonderful our nurses are. But I'm trying to determine what is the key driver of choice. And is that going to make a difference? OK, so at that point in time, uh, trying to solve that riddle, um, you're, you're winning on compassion, but not necessarily winning uh, the, the market share game. Uh, let me make one other point. I'm sorry. Uh, interestingly, also, when you looked at the research, we were winning in what health system would you choose by significant numbers, and what, what hospital are you most aware of? But when you got more granular, those numbers started falling off. So something was obviously imbalanced. Right. So we uh, start digging a little deeper. And keep in mind at the time, this is like 2002, 2003, we're looking at the national dynamics. I mean, what's going on out there? So the more, most important issue of the day was terrorism and national security. Number two was health care, cost of health care, access to health care. And like a lot of the trends that you're going to see, I think, in the next few slides, um, that's probably more true today than it was then, for obvious reasons. Other national dynamics that we were looking at, we, we found that People are becoming more health conscious. Their definition of health and what, what health care is was expanding. There was, there was more to it than there had been in the past. Uh, that they were out there seeking more credible analytical data regarding their choices, uh, playing a more active role in their decisions. So they're more likely to spend their own money uh, if they see value um, and at their own risk on things that are important to them. And we're seeing that hospital choice uh, was based on many characteristics, not just their physician. So in a lot of respects, um, that, that ran counter to what we were thinking at the time. You know, doctors are driving all of these decisions. Uh, the physician is not the only or the final factor in the choice. People are willing to change doctors, um, and marketing can influence them. And, and that was coming through in the research that we found based on the fact that uh, people were spending so little time with their actual physician that it was a lot of the support system and other, um, and other characteristics that was driving them and interesting them. 
So basically, it all came down to it's about making choices. Um, and that's a key word. You'll see that uh, pop up in the, in the uh, communications that we developed later and in the strategy. Um, and essentially, if we provide a lot of choices and, and a great value, perception of value, uh, that, that, that company that does that is going to win the game. Um, as Milton Friedman said, said, nobody spends somebody else's money as carefully as they spend their own. People are really going to research and, and, and spend their money wisely. So at that point in time, wanted to dig even a little deeper. Right, so um, again, back in 2003, um, I'm looking at this data, I'm seeing that, okay, we're doing really well in awareness, we're doing really well in choice. Um, looking granular, seeing service lines aren't looking quite right, so started um, doing some additional research. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with HealthStream, but they have a product um, that really allows you to do some really interesting psychographic segmentation research. So I thought that's what we really want to do. We want to decide how do people behave, how can I better target my dollar, is there a consumer out there that responds better to advertising, you know, and is it unique to healthcare? I mean, you hear it for the banking industry, you hear it for the automotive industry, but is, it the, is there something out there for healthcare? There has to be something. And so um, I started doing research in 2003, and I did learn, next slide, um, that there absolutely are indeed categories that are, are related to healthcare, and um, here are five of them. Avid partners, we found, are very information driven. Those are those individuals that are going to go on the internet, they're going to research their symptoms, they're going to walk into their physician's office, and they're going to have a piece of paper, and they're going to tell them, you know, this is what I might have. Or maybe they pick up one of your publications and they see a procedure that's going to be done and, and they want to talk to their physician about it. Um, autopilots, um, they're generally, and you know, I don't mean to insult anyone, but they're usually the men and they're usually the husbands of the avid partners, okay? Um, avid partners are generally women and they are telling their husbands once a year you need to go get your physical. So that's why they're, they're on autopilot. Then you have your loyal patients, and I want to make sure I point out loyal patients because they're relationship driven. They're the ones that you find are very loyal to their doctors. If their doctor says, I want you to run over that bridge three times and back, they're doing it, okay? They're not the ones that are influenced at all by what you send to them in the mail, okay? They are very, very loyal to their physicians. Um, then you have fixums, and those are the ones that are going to come to you regardless. They show up in your ED generally. They just don't, can't worry about anything. Just fix me, make me better, and I'm gone, okay? They're not going to be, there's no loyalty there. They just want you to fix them and, and move along. And then you have your no-timers, which is really not a very big segment of, of the population, believe it or not. They're generally young people right out of college, um, you know, invincible, don't need health care insurance, not, never will get sick don't need to think about physicals, I'll worry about that when I'm in my 40s. Hmm. Um, so those are the no timers. So I learned this very interesting research and then I found out how it applied to my market. Okay, and this is what I learned. Um, there was only one segment and that was, um, that could be influenced by marketing and uh, when we looked at the key drivers of choice, specifically compassion, um, I wasn't going to be one of the ones that would influence them. So we knew we ranked really high in compassionate care, but the one audience that's going to be influenced by advertising really doesn't care about that. <laughs> okay, so when you, you look at Avid Partners, you see um, that 47% of them are very interested in acquiring their own knowledge. Again, they're the ones that walk into the doctor's office. They see a new procedure, procedure that you're doing at your hospital. They see a new drug. They're the ones that walk in and they say, you know, why am I not trying the purple pill? Okay, because they do listen. They do a lot of reading. Um, they perceive themselves, of course, as decision makers, which is extremely important. I always say that, that they're the ones, if you're going to write an article in a publication, don't tell them what to pack in, a, in their child's lunchbox. Tell them why. They don't want to know what, they want to know why, okay? So totally different mindset, because we're used to just, we're used to telling people things. We're used to not telling them why. Um, but we also found, interestingly, that um, this group of, of people also, they're willing to pay more. 
If they're willing to pay more because they want the technology and they want the positions. So um, they lack loyalty. They will change positions in a second. Um, they are high users of specialty services because they're usually very, very educated. Um, and so they definitely are a group of individuals that we wanted to target. And if you have limited dollars, you don't want to waste them on all of those other categories that I showed you if, if they're not going to be influenced by advertising. Specialty care? Yes, I mentioned specialty care. Yeah. Okay. So in our market, um, what you can see here is, and this again, I gotta go back, this, the, the latest, I, I do these studies every so often, and, and we're cutting this one off at 2006 for just the purposes of this presentation. Um, but you can see that in 2006, that in Savannah, Georgia, on the right, 23% of our population, they were avid partners. You can also see that 28% were loyal patients. Of course, that represents, you know, 50% of the market, basically. Those other three categories, I don't need to worry about. So why should I talk to them? Why should I develop messaging that's going to talk to those individuals? Why should I use programming for those individuals? Why should I choose media for those individuals? Because they don't care about advertising. Okay, they're going to be influenced totally differently. So, but how do I find? How do I find the 23 percent? Okay, and how do I also tap into the 28 percent when I'm not going to get to them through advertising? I'm going to get through, to them through a different way. When you look at the avid partners, uh, there was a way to, to, to look at the demographic makeup of that group, but what we got was something that was very broad. So 35 to 54, higher income women, well-educated, well, gosh, that's kind of what we're already buying. So um, how do we separate, how do we reach these people? How do we separate them from the other people that are out there? And uh, you know, if there is a way to do it where we can spend our money way more efficiently, then being outspent three to one isn't gonna be such a problem. If we could focus on that 25% of the, of the market that's avid partners and spend all our money against them, now we've got to fight in chance. So uh, this is really kind of the innovative part of the presentation, I mean, uh, and, and the whole strategy was we, we went to some other research uh, um, that was available to answer some of those questions. How do we specifically target them? Because now we know who those people are, how do we get to them? So we fused some research. Uh, so we started with HealthStream, which essentially, you know, we, we identified the avid partners and that taught us what, what they think, okay? Then we went to Simmons uh, uh, National Study. Um, it's a national panel uh, with 6,000, 60,000 data points. And that told us what their media usage was, um, you know, what their non-healthcare lifestyle choices were, uh, and some psychographic information, enough psychographic information that we could dovetail it uh, with, with the health stream. And then we went further, so Simmons tells us what they do, right? And cohorts uh, would tell us where they live. Um, that's a geo-targeting capability uh, that allows us to take it right down to the postal route. So theoretically, by, by uh, fusing these pieces of research together, we can actually find an avid partner person and see what house they live in in the market. And that was not data, you know, there's a lot of geo-targeting being done now on the internet, but you gotta remember we're talking, this is 2003. And so a lot of that data was not available there. Right. So we, had, we created this uniquely. Okay. Uh, I added this, this is some background on Simmons, if you don't know what Simmons is or how to get this, some uh, background information that's in the deck. You can uh, refer to that, and same with cohorts. Um, so I want to show you kind of how it went. Uh, when doing the health stream uh, research, um, we uh, essentially uh, uh, developed a whole list of questions for people to answer, data points, you know, what their impressions were on things. And then we found that we could marry those up very effectively with Simmons. I'll give you an example of, and you know, this is of, uh, hundreds of questions that were asked, uh, you know, uh, for health stream, the question was, I make sure I go in for physicals and checkups when I'm supposed to. For Simmons, the, the similar question was, I have regular medical checkups. Uh, for health stream, it was my friends and family tell me I should take care of myself. Uh, I don't take care of myself like I should. For Simmons, uh, the question answered was, I don't care of my, take care of myself as I should. So you can see that there was a way to go through both sets of data, sort of like uh, two, two contact information bases you might have on your phone. When you want to merge them, you kind of line them up. 
And we could do that, and then we could draw correlations between that AVID partner, uh, those uh, from health streams, and then Simmons data, which says here's all their media habits. And then further, to take it from AVID partners to um, the cohorts, um, cohorts also does psychographic um, uh, uh, modeling, and, but they broke it out into many more than five groups. So what we did is we went and looked at all of their, all of their groups and, and uh, picked out the characteristics of them and lined them up best with the five groups from HealthStream. So uh, that allowed us to then make that connection between what they think, what they do, and where they live. And so what emerged, for example, this is very old, but, uh, and it's changed because all of this stuff is evolving, um, but we, we could literally get then a geo, geo demographic model of where our audience is in the market, um, all the way down to lists that we could generate, um, and also uh, health conditions and, and all sorts of things like that. So able to get much, much more efficient, which was, after all, the objective. Uh, then to just give you some sense for the kind of information that reveals in, in a few slides here, um, you can see how um, avid partners and loyal patients are quite different from each other and how they index against um, uh, total adults. So avid partners um, actually younger, um, loyal patients skewing older. Household differentiation in terms of income. Um, the avid partners are pretty wealthy. That's why they're probably willing to spend so much of their own money on things that, that uh, matter to them. Um, so their, their income is higher. Of course, they're younger. Uh, the loyal patients may have wealth, but they are not working anymore, so their income is lower, probably. But you can see the trends there as well. So those, those folks make good customers. Um, additional uh, differentiation, you can see the uh, loyal, avid partners are more educated, um, they're, they're married, uh, very high index there, employed with children at home, owning a home, all of those good things. And then we can uh, cross tab on their media involvement. And again, uh, can't stress enough that the data you're seeing is, is old. Um, it, is, it has been updated, but we're showing you this is a lot of the stuff that, that we solved the problem with. So back in 2006, um, even though they were uh, early adopters, the internet, um, internet usage is not quite as high as it is today. But you can break out their habits and you can see um, their avid partners, for instance, watching a little bit less TV than, than the average, um, not reading as many magazines, but that has to do a lot with the market as well. Um, radio was high. Uh, uh, a, little, a little above average, um, and internet was, was um, above average. Specifically, if you look at where they were um, uh, in the top two quintiles in terms of internet use, those folks were really on the cutting edge. So, and, that, and that's a trend that, that is you know, continuing on, and I imagine that's going on in every market for all of you. Interesting though, TV is still king. Um, even though they're interested in the internet, they're still spending more time in front of the television. And uh, given a number of, go back, go oh, back. Becky wanted to make a point there. Go back, I wanna make a point about that. <laughs> Um, I don't know if all of you are dealing with the same issue, um, especially when you change to any type of psychographic or market segmentation marketing. Um, you have to also educate your boards, right? You have to educate your leadership team so that they understand what's going on because they are really used to traditional advertising. And as I mentioned earlier, especially if you're doing a lot of mission-based type promotion and advertising, it's, it's, that's, there, um, there's emotional attachment to that. So it's very hard to help someone understand that you know, while we love that and we own it and we're gonna still talk about it, it can't be king. Um, but the same thing happens, I don't know if you'll have this issue, with newspapers and your board. Do y'all have this problem? You know, they don't ever talk to me about TV, but boy, when I, they start seeing ads in the newspaper, my phone starts ringing. Um, but interestingly, you can see, there's not, a, there's not a lot of time being spent 
in newspapers with this particular psychographic group that we're talking about. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time in newspapers. I have to constantly remind them that they need to put on their avid partner psychographic hat, okay, and pretend to be that person. And that generally, if they don't see an ad that I'm running, it's because I'm not targeting them. Okay? And they finally get that. But for a while, it was, I'm not seeing anything, I'm not seeing anything. Well, that's good. <laughs> okay? Because you're not the one I'm trying to talk to. Yeah, so this, this uh, ends up being a pretty important chart, too. So this is, uh, you know, percentage of people reached with the different media in the market. And so, you know, as we're building a media strategy in that market back in 2006, we got to be in TV. Um, uh, newspaper um, is, you know, there's... there's a presence there. Uh, radio could be very effective, except uh, the, the, the type of radio in that market is very, very fractured, very fragmented. Uh, so in, in internet was already on the radar screen and is growing. There's also um, a lot of um, money spent in outdoor and direct mail in that market too because of the geo-targeting that we were doing. So the planning tools that we can get then from, from being able to tap into Simmons is, for instance, if you just get back to, um, to the um, uh, cable networks, uh, we, we can chart exactly what the AVID partners are doing with regard to all the different uh, cable channels. And further, we can go and see what kind of cable programming they're watching. And, and this is where you start to see some things that surprise you. It's like, uh, we're down in Savannah, Georgia. Would you think that the best buy you could make from an index standpoint was Formula One racing on TV? Or that uh, number three would be, I understand SEC college basketball all day long, but bicycling, uh, arena cross, mixed martial arts, things like that. So this is stuff others are not really clamoring to buy. We can get in there and do it. We're really reaching our target. Yeah? Yeah. They are. They are. Yeah. They are. In fact, I, I was giving, uh, I'll give you all a secret. <laughs> okay, even if this is being recorded. Um, even NASCAR and NFL have now moved into the top four slots since this was done in um, 2007, 2008. Yes, um, Avid Partner women are very involved. Um, they're very involved in their kids' lives. They get really involved in football. They get really, it's, they are, um, I'll call them informal leaders. They're that individual that you go to if you need a pediatrician, that you go to if you want to know a handyman. You, go, you know, they just are very, very informative people. But they um, have a lot of interest. They do not fit a traditional mold. And I can tell you, when this, I started seeing this data, I didn't believe it. And I even went back and checked it. And this changed our total buying strategy. Um, and until I actually started seeing the results, I still didn't believe it. <laughs> Um, but we started seeing the results. But since this time, I will tell you that NASCAR and NFL have, boom, gone to the top. So that whole adage that women don't like sports, is, I mean, I'm one of them. I love watching sports. So, so yes. It's. So then we start thinking about the message. Okay, so we know who these people are, and, and we've developed a, a media plan. Um, and so how are we going to present this hospital system to these people? Well, we know that they're demanding information, that it's really important to them to feel smart about their choices, um, and they want choices. You know, we're going to give them choices. Um, they want to um, share in, uh, we need to share technology. They need to see uh, how things work. Um, they want to know what technology that we have. We need to really show them and introduce them to our specialists in different ways. Uh, and they want to be involved. So we essentially, we need to anticipate their needs. Uh, we have a profile on them. We know how they're aging and things like that. So we try to anticipate their needs and serve this information up. Um, you know, smart is highlighted. It's another key word in our strategy. So choice and smart. And so you go about developing a messaging strategy and a positioning statement looks something like St. Joseph Candler is the health system of choice for specialists and independent physicians and enlightened patients who live smart. In other words, St. Joseph Candler practices smart medicine. 
Uh, and smart medicine is a combination of the newest technology, top specialists, and in interaction with customers. So again, this is something we put into place seven years ago. And who doesn't want to be smart, right? So there's also that implied implication. Implied implication. That was a good one. Um, you know, we're implying if you don't make the right choice, you're not smart, you're not right? You're Everybody not wants to feel like they're smart. So especially avid partners, they want to feel smart. So that's one of the reasons why we really focused in on that branding. Um, and then, of course, I have to explain this to a creative team. <laughs> And so pictures help sometimes. So um, what I tried to show them was St. Joseph Candler is really the home of the best technology in the region. We needed to convince consumers of that. And, and it was true, so um, that was something we had to do. And we wanted to show that smart consumers choose that technology and that system. Smart doctors also choose it. And that leads to the practice of smart medicine. And that leads to the best outcomes, uh, and that is the live smart m mantra. And essentially, all of that fulfills that mission. So what's kind of interesting is we had done all this work prior to developing this strategy to talk about their mission of compassionate care and all of that, won that battle. It didn't mean as much as it should have. And now that mission is really relegated to um, I mean, it's not the central message. It's, it's uh, everything else supports the fact that they have a mission. Okay, yeah, so and on that pre previous slide, when you talk about mission, it's a support position. Um, you know, you never want to give away who you are. And so we are able to continue to meet our mission through many, many different other activities, using public relations activities. It's the advertising dollar that we're talking about today, so I want to make sure that's specified. It's in advertising. Um, and then also, when we talked about, on the last slide, sorry, about the um, techno, he's so used to me doing this, um, <laughs> about the technology and the specialists. You heard me earlier when I talked about key drivers of choice, and I said, darn, it wasn't compassionate care, right? Um, it's techno for avid partners, it's technology and it's specialists, okay? They're the type that'll say, you know what, I really do want you to hold my hand, and I want you to be there for me, and that's great. Dad gummit, you better have the right technology and you better have the best doctors. Okay? That's what makes them choose. If that's what makes them choose, and we have it, but they don't think we have it, and the data tell us that they don't think we have it, we've got to make them think we have it, because we do have it. So that's the dilemma that we were in. You know, perception's reality. It doesn't matter whether or not you have it or not if they don't believe it. And because we were faith-based, we were winning compassionate care by default and losing the other simply because people just made this assumption that because you're faith-based, you're going to have the best technology. So we had to change that. Especially not when you're going up against an academic medical system. Exactly. So we don't want to get rid of mission, which is extremely important to us. That is woven into what we do. But we have to win in the other categories. So. Okay. Sorry. So um, we're just going to go through these really, really quickly. Um, so of course, you start, the word smart starts infiltrating everything that we're doing. We had um, an internal publication called Smart Living um, change the way the entire thing was written. Um, before, it was a lot of features about doctors and you know, all of the headlines mentioned our name. St. Joseph's Candler buys new equipment. You know, you, St. Joseph's Candler has an opening at such and such. No, no, no. Had to change the content to be all about, say, the disease. Um, because avid partners want to know about, tell me about the disease, tell me about breast cancer, tell me about the symptoms, tell me about how, to, how you know, if, if there's any prevention. And then you have to weave into that any messaging that you have about your facility. If you start off in those first couple of paragraphs talking about yourself, they turn the page. They're not interested. So we had to totally change the way we wrote every brochure, every magazine, every publication we had. So these are some internal just publications that had to do with our senior market and our internal market. You can see these are just two color pieces that we've done. But again, you can start seeing the word smart just start showing up everywhere. Um, also started doing a few newspaper insert pieces. I will say that we have slowly stopped these, but at that time in 2003, um, because we were able to get such good placement with our newspapers, these worked really, really well for us because they were highly informative. They became what I call coffee table pieces. 
I mean, you know, y'all know what I'm talking about, where people actually really do hold on to them. And they had such a long life. A year later, I was still having people bring these things in. So we had one for every major service line that we did. We're just simply showing a neuro one that we did here. But again, the information was information heavy, branding not so heavy. Okay. And now it has evolved into electronic documents. It has, exactly. Um, again, um, targeted direct mail, because we were able to uniquely take local information that I had through HealthStream, take the national information that you saw with Simmons and you saw with the cohorts, and because we were able to layer all of that, then I was able to target this media. You have to remember, you know, you have two 45-year-olds or two 50-year-olds. Do they act the same way? They don't, right? You can have a 50-year-old who acts like they're 65, and you can have a 50-year-old that acts like they're 35. Okay, so I simply stopped marketing by demographics, absolutely stopped, and only did it by psychographics. So when we were doing um, our direct mail pieces, so one person might get it at their, their 108 address, but 106 didn't. And they didn't get it because of their income. They didn't get it because of their behavior. And I can tell you there was a lot of conversations uh, with Melissa that, uh, as we're trying to present concepts that went Stop, don't talk to me about demographics. <laughs> we always do it, stop. You know, so we had to, we, it, it's a process. You, had to, you know, you got to convert the whole staff over. You got to convert the agency Change over. Change your way of thinking. Print ads. And, and notice in this print ad, that's a doctor, okay? And that's a patient. And what's great about this is, and you'll see in some of our TV in just a moment, is that you're showing a doctor who, um, Avid partners want to hear about. They want to know they're, they're involved in the patient's care. That's the patient who's running. She's timing him. He was able to get back to running. Um, but what you're also showing, loyal patients. Remember we talked about loyal patients? You're kind of showing loyal patients our relationship with doctors. So there's a secondary strategy going on, too. And, and you know, we just got done telling you that the media buy, you know, that there was, uh, that, the, that the newspaper was not as important. But... But we didn't we didn't get out of that stuff entirely, you know. So we we changed the way we use it a little bit. The newspaper was more inserts and less just run of press ads, and and then in these uh, magazine placements were very were very targeted, you know. Uh, also uh, developing uh, online and display. So SEM um, now more and more over the last few years, as you can imagine, and um, digital ads that. Um, are very focused then um, with, the, with the message and very focused with uh, placement uh, geodemographically and, um, uh, and of course, uh, we're using all the best practices in terms of online media buying and optimization and whatnot. Um, so, uh, but the lion's share of the dollars, both for production and, and for um, and for media placement um, in that market is TV. And I will say that the uh, St. Joseph Candler um, allows us to, to really get uh, around the message. We produce about six TV spots a year, uh, and we, are, we have the ability to feature then lots of different aspects of the organization in lots of different ways. So this, is, uh, this, this spot you're about to see is a, is a positioning um, kind of uh, uh, encapsulate what smart medicine really is, and then you'll see all the other components of it. This is one of the more recent ones, it's about th two years old, three years old. The other stuff that you're gonna see goes, is, is back to some of the original, the original batch. If you couldn't hear that, I'd be happy to do it over no, again. No, we've got we've got others. Okay, we're gonna run out of time. Um, so, uh, so that's the the big picture. That's the the branding. Um, 
uh, this independent doctors is a big component. You might want to talk about that in your market with your. Right, we're in our market. I don't know if a lot of you deal with this, but um, most of our specialists are independent. We don't own them. Um, we are community hospitals. Um, again, our, our major competitor is an academic facility, and a lot of their physicians are employed. Of course, they have a residency program. Um, but the physicians in our community practice at all three hospitals. Okay, so they, they practice at all three of them. Um, but we work primarily with what we call the independent specialists. And so we started doing a lot of research into their uh, practice patterns as well, uh, especially when looking at how people were making choices. And we knew that specialists really ranked high on, one, on their key drivers of choice. So we had to know, well, what are specialists doing? And found um, that uh, two out of every three times an independent specialist was going to refer them to our health system. And as you see this, you'll see that we're, we're doing our best to humanize these people. We're, we're not trying to present wax figurines of specialists. We're trying to make them come off like people who are very approachable and that you can interact with. I can operate more precisely with extra eyes. I can stop a heart attack with a high-tech balloon. I zap cataracts at 40,000 cycles per second. I use high-energy sound waves to find hidden tumors. I can rebuild you with titanium. With the latest technology and procedures, it's no wonder more independent physicians choose to practice at St. Joseph's Candler. I choose. I choose. I choose. I choose St. Joseph's Candler. Next up, the patients choose. <laughs> so get to know some of the folks in Savannah um, and you know, through the great series of spots, you get to know quite a few of them, actually, and we, we tell many, many stories. I chose to get my life back. I chose to be around for my family. To continue gardening. To keep fishing. To always be there for my congregation. To continue being creative. I chose the best place to have my babies. In Southeast Georgia, more people choose St. Joseph's Candler for the latest advances in medicine than any other health system in the region. I choose. I choose. I choose. I choose. I choose St. Joseph's Candler. What's more, we even feature the staff because they're a part of the hospital system and getting to know them is important. And the values. And their values. We are on a mission to always be true to our values. To show compassion. To give you quality care. To work with integrity. To always be courteous. To be accountable. To walk as a team. With six core values and one common goal, it's no wonder more patients choose St. Joseph's Candler than any other health system in the region. And then we can drill down to service areas, so we know exactly where we're trying to make an impact. Uh, we know where we, what physicians we want to feature, and we rotate through. Again, when you're producing six spots a year, then um, over the course of time, we can really touch on all the key players. I choose to practice at the Heart Hospital because they have everything I need to help patients like Trey. He had a heart attack. Two of his arteries are 100% blocked. So I performed an emergent bypass. Because of the technology available, we got him back to doing what he loves to do. That's why I choose St. Joseph's Camera. So that, that, that spot kind of represents, I don't want to say a formula, but it's, it's something that we've really been working with for quite some time. You've got the interaction of the, you feature the doctor, you've got them inter, really interacting with uh, the patient, even though uh, in that spot they weren't exactly standing next to each other. Uh, but you see how approachable they are. You see the, the problem and how the problem was solved. Um, and it all comes off without being too technical, too geeky. It's all very, uh, it makes you feel good about the organization and about the physician. Yeah, and, and one other key point is, um that we learned about Avid Partners is they want to hear other people talk about you. They don't want to hear you talk about you. So having a doctor say, it, they gave me the technology, they gave me the tools that I needed, you know, that's why I choose. Because this guy could choose to go anywhere. This particular doctor you just saw, okay, he'd go anywhere he wanted to go. He didn't have to practice at our facilities. So what you're saying is, I'm not saying St. Joseph's Candler, I'm saying this doctor is saying, they gave me this, they gave me that. 
Those happen to be the two things that Avid Partners want, right? So then I chose. So if I choose, then you know what? Maybe you should choose. So that's. Um, so you can see how we play it off again in another spot from that same year for ortho. I choose to practice at St. Joseph's Camp because they have the tools to help patients. Patients like Barbara. She needed a hip replacement. Because she's so active, I went with a high performance metal on metal device. Works like a charm. I chose the right team. And I choose St. Joseph's Camp. We've had doctors on motorcycles. We've had them fly fishing. We've, How had, did them, it, we've had them dancing. <laughs> How did it work, Melissa? Which, okay, okay, we're gonna talk about how it worked. Okay, we're, fine, we're, we're wrapping things up here. Okay, again, we're talking about that period in time that I talked about earlier, um, that, that 2003 to about 2007, actually. Um, and the results, I have to take my glasses off and look at my own thing here. I, can't, I have to either put that on with my glasses or look at this without them. Um, so if you look at our results, when it came to specialists, we had 25% increase in a three-year period of time um, on what, how people perceived our specialists. So that's a huge increase. But if you looked at technology, we had a 42.9% increase in how people perceived our availability of technology. Um, if you look at uh, the, uh, the, the next. next slide, which has to do with... Um, that has to do with top of mind awareness. I think uh, you heard me say at the beginning, we were already, even though we were being outspent, people were more aware of our health system, but we still were able to increase um, by seven more percent to, uh, to 93 percent um, in our top of mind awareness. And so um, we extended our lead by seven percent, and that wasn't even what we were trying to do. We were trying to really get more granular to the, to the uh, service line level. And I'm, I'm not specifying service lines, but I just picked out a couple of them. Um, one of the service lines that we were working on, we had a 46.2% increase in market share as a result. Uh, and another one, we had a 48% increase. And um, in a service line that we were already winning in, that we didn't even attempt to do anything with. So you know about the halo effect. Everyone knows if you, you know, there's that halo effect. If you're working on certain service lines that are really, really high tech anyway, you do get that halo. Well, if they're really, really good in heart, they must be really, really good in neuro. You know, if they're really good in this, they must be good in that. So we weren't even trying to uh, increase that one because it was already pretty high, but we did get a 3.2% bump, and I'll take it every day. So um, we did see that we could spend far less money we could spend it in a very, very targeted manner, um, and that we could have results, and, and that was the bottom line. And you know, I cannot say enough about looking at, at market segmentation in your market and looking at psychographics. And again, it's not as new now as it was probably in 2003 when we were doing it, and we were trying to look for a unique way of doing it because we do have the internet, and it does give us a lot of data. But I can't say enough about do not stop at that top level. It would have been so easy for me after I did those um, surveys in 2003 to say, oh wow, look at our awareness. Look, you know, look, look, everybody wants to choose us. This is fantastic. And stopped, okay? Because you're like, oh, I can, go to, I can go to the board meeting. I can show everybody how great we're doing. Look at these numbers. But you can't. You have to go down deeper. Because if you have any erosion anywhere else, you know, eventually that erosion is going to, to creep up and creep up and creep up. And so what maybe worked in the 90s or what worked in the 80s was not going to work in the 2000s. And we knew that we had to make some kind of change. And we knew that we were going to be impacted by being overspent. So we had to figure out a way to be smarter. Y'all see how I got that in here? <laughs> okay. We had to figure out a way to be smarter. Um, and that's what we were able to do. And we had a lot of success. And, and my partner here was of great help in helping us make that messaging and all Thanks. work well that's kind of it we're, so we're open to questions we I will I will tell you if you okay if you want to see we so a lot of that work was kind of the first generation creative uh, you can go to the st. Joseph Candler website or to the stir website to see um, the more recent stuff because we've continued to evolve also, before anybody leaves, the, um, I want to just mention, I, know, I don't want to do too, too much self-promotion, but 
as an agency, we, uh, that team that's been doing all this creative um, has teamed up and we're going to give away a free TV commercial uh, uh, to people who apply for it if it's a, 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 something's for the greater good. It's called the greater good giveaway. So if, if one of your organizations um, wants to submit an application, uh, we'll put a, a full piece of production together uh, at absolute minimum cost to you. Um, so uh, go to our website and apply. There's some, there's some forms in the back that you can find, and there's also something in your packet. So questions? Any questions? There's one back there. The question is, did we see a disproportionate improvement in the AVID Partners segment versus yes. others? Yes, yes we did. And, and we even saw a difference by um, what I call lifestyle clusters, because I told you about our market earlier, how we have Hilton Head and we have the bases and all that. So we were even looking at AVID Partners at, at that level too. So yes, the, we saw dramatic results in AVID Partners. Um, but we saw results in all of the categories across the board, but the most significant results in the Avid Partners, which is, is who we wanted. Um, and again, we used other tactics to get to loyal patients. So don't think we ignored loyal patients. You cannot. Although loyal patients are shrinking considerably, your Avid Partners now, just based on what I'm reading, you know, our said 23% in Savannah is probably up to about 29% to 30% now, and we've even increased from 25 to 54 to, from, to 25 to 60. Because, you know, all of the boomers, as they've gotten older, since 2003, I mean, you got to remember this almost 10 years ago. So they're early adopters of technology. They really do fit more in the avid partner category than they do the loyal patient category. And you probably all had, you know, grandparents that you would say were loyal patients, right? Yes, yes, ma'am. Oh, wow, those are great questions. Well, they, they want me to restate the question for the, because it's oh, being okay. recorded. Um, well, you wanted to know how I dealt with potential Stark issues. Is that, that's correct, right? And how I went about choosing physicians. Is that mainly the two things? Okay. With internal policies. Oh, yes. I can tell you all about it. Um, <laughs> Yes, let's talk about the Stark thing first, because I spent lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of time with physicians, I mean with attorneys, after uh, we determined this strategy. And the key here is, if I was going on TV and saying, hey, look at how great Dr. Bailey is, please choose him, I've just broken the law, okay? But if Dr. Bailey chooses to go on camera, and I always ask them, you have to say, and I make them sign something. They have to say, I absolutely believe what I am saying. I mean, they have to say, I believe what I am saying. I absolutely choose this facility. If they choose to say that they are choosing the facility, then we're okay. We have it re-reviewed, because you know how laws kind of morph and change slightly? Um, every couple of years, we go back and re-review that again, just to make sure that all of a sudden there's some little ruling that didn't slip in there that made us not be doing it correctly. Um, the, there was, there is a little bit of a battle sometimes because now doctors say, "Oh, you, I've seen all these doctors over the years that you have. Do one on me." Well, I, I, I can't just go do one on you. I have to have a reason. I can't just say, "Oh, I choose you because you're really nice to me." Um, so the first thing that I did was I went to the medical executive committee uh, meeting and about got eaten alive. Um, you know, how are you going to do this, and how are you going to choose these doctors, and who is the priority, and this is stupid. <laughs> you know, why are you doing this? Um, and so I actually, uh, there was a physician on that committee that I really, really respected. And, uh, you know, afterwards he said, wow, you had on the Teflon suit, didn't you? And I said, yep, I did. Um, he said, listen, here's, here's my recommendation. I want you to go to every practice and meet with every group individually, which is what I did. And I just, first of all, I let them get it all off their chest, and then I asked them, well, how would you choose? How would you choose the doctors? And they said, well, I mean, you have sections. Oh, I do, don't I? I do have sections. So do you think maybe who's the head of the section should be, is, is maybe that, 
Well, of course. Oh, well, that's a great idea. I'm so glad y'all came up with that idea. <laughs> okay. Which, you know, is how we would have done it anyway. Um, the problem that you run into after you've done that is at some point you've gone through all of those people. But then you don't have the politics anymore because you've already hit the people who are going to give you the most problem. Okay. Um, we also prioritize based on service line. So there are certain service lines that will never, never have it happen. So we do it based on, you know, what from a strategic standpoint are our most important service lines and what are we going to do there. Um, but we have the, the opposite kind of problem now where, you know, we have a lot of physicians who want to be involved. We've, we've, we have doctors, I, I don't mind saying, that um, are not conducive to TV. <laughs> Is that, is that okay? Did I say that okay? Not okay. mediagenic. Not just that. I stutters and um, did you had, had no idea. Um, had one freeze and couldn't even tell me his name. So you have all kinds of situations with that. So, but the great thing about multimedia is that there's another option for them. We have several of them that are great. We, we didn't let you, you didn't hear any of our radio spots. Radio spots are the same way, tell a lot of stories. The radio spots people love because the patient gets to speak more. And, you know, when you get to hear about someone making their biscuits <laughs> and then their arm went numb and they weren't quite sure what to do, but they had to get the biscuits in the oven, you know, all of a sudden a person realizes this is a real person and this really happened to them. And then the doctor starts talking and said, I was so glad that Mrs. Jones made the right decision and called 911 and got to the hospital and you know and then he tells that story and then we get letters from people saying you know it means so, it means so much to me that you have real people on TV you know we've had rest, patients who are wrestlers you know we've had we've had a very very interesting group of, of, of people but that's how we got around the doctor issue um, I'm not saying it doesn't rear, rear its ugly head every now and then because it can um, but that's almost gone away now because they all get it. After this amount of time, they get it. Yeah. Question? Uh, you mentioned that you uh, married the health styles question um, with the syndicated research question. Did, did you do that statistically, or did you just make some judgments based on questions that seemed to matter? Well, it was pretty obvious. I mean, uh, they were kind of written to some degree with that in mind initially, but um, also a, a pretty clear in terms of a judgment call. Yeah. 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 In the back. How to balance that? How to balance media buying yeah. well, uh, with disease states that tend to be demographically driven? We don't do a lot of advertising for disease states that are demographically driven. We do a lot of public relations. Service lines law, like, give me an example. Like, for example, we don't do pulmonology at all because generally they come in through the ED. You know, um, as far as promoting, say, edu from an educational standpoint, we have a, a, a totally different education strategy that's just simply about educating the public. The publications you saw, for example, that we had, those go to thousands and thousands of people every other month. So we use those for a lot of disease process type education. If that kind of helps answer that question, but in a 30-second spot, it's very, very difficult to, you know, get into that. And, and the other thing we run into, I'm sure y'all do too, is so much of this, I'm going to pick on stroke, they get it everywhere. You know, the warning signs of a stroke, they get it, they, you know, you can't say it enough times, but you don't want to use your real estate for it when you know that they're going to get it a number of other times. Um, so we have really tried to keep our advertising dollars specifically targeting the AVID partner and our public relations efforts and other tactics and publications like we had before for more of the educational piece. You're welcome. Yes, ma'am. Yes, so um, six years later, are you still focusing on the AVID Yes, more than ever. Um, that's, that's a very good question. First of all, let me say, um, when I first sat down with all of our media after I did this, uh, the word out of their mouth was, huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what, what? 
Because I said, you know, I'm not, I don't want to look at the demographics. I really want to talk about these audiences. Let's talk about the audiences. So we spent a, spent a lot of time doing that. Um, having said that, we immediately started, uh, started changing the percentage of our buys. Um, in fact, the very first and second year, there's some dramatic changes, and I'm not going to say them specifically just for, you know, privacy reasons. There were several, um, s several mediums that took maybe a $200,000 each hit in spend because we shifted those dollars into a category that would hit the Avid Partners. Now, as time has gone on, we have shifted many more dollars in online because online provides for us many of the things that we were trying to do our, on our own in 2003. So we were, you know, we were doing it on our own then, but now I can buy a lot of that information. And so we're, seeing, we're taking a lot of our dollars and we're slowly, you know, there's going to be that period of time where we have overlap, but um, we're seeing huge success in our online geo-behavioral targeting of Avid Partners. But TV is always going to be a powerhouse, um, and it's going to be the thing that really creates an image, um, and really, uh, you know, the, the the online really kind of supports in a lot of ways. So uh, having that that big piece of it so efficient is really helping us, and it's evolving um, every year. We look at it. Yeah. Anything yeah, else, guys? Hey, thanks for coming. Thanks for really your attendance. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. How about Melissa? Thanks, Melissa.